Well, uh, welcome everybody. Welcome to our Women in Leadership uh, series. And uh, you'll see, I'm Ann Quiello, by the way, uh, those of you who, who I do not know. I'm uh, the host of each month's uh, Women in Leadership series. But today joining me is a fellow um, executive coach and senior consultant at TurkNet, and that's Dr. Barbara Riley. And she is going to be co-hosting with me today. And you'll also see uh, Jerry uh, Gigno on the screen. She's our special guest. And of course, we'll give them much more worthy introductions in a few minutes, but I wanted to, to uh, let you know who you're seeing on our screen today. Um, while we're um, waiting for everybody to join us, it'd be interesting to know from you all, what interesting thing have you been doing in celebration of uh, this month's Black History Month? So if there's something that you've been doing that, uh, that's been honoring uh, Black History Month, we'd love to hear about it. So enter it into the uh, chat area, if you will, and uh, we'll uh, take a look. So again, uh, thank you for joining us, those of you who are just coming on. Um, we are, we'll begin in just a few minutes but I uh, would love to hear what is the interesting thing that you've been doing in celebration of Black History Month? Let's see. And again, on your screen, you'll see our special guest, Jerry uh, Gigno, who we will introduce in just a few minutes, and my co-host today, Dr. Barbara Riley. Um, Wow, we've got quite a few people joining us. This is wonderful. So what have you all been doing? Celebrating amazing women highlighted via LinkedIn. Every day I see many women who are tremendously accomplished. Reading books by black authors. Yeah, there's some fantastic books that have been recently published in fact. Um, through our employee resource network, we focused on saluting staff graduated. Wow. Good morning. I attended a great panel on Mythbusters. Yes, Dr. Barbara Riley. Yes, that is interesting. Um, Barb, you want to just tell us briefly um, about what kinds of myths you heard? Sure. So um, I'll just share one. And this was put together by a, a, a group at Slalom Consulting, and the group is called Reach, um, and they are an employee resource group. They put together a uh, about 12 or 14 what they called myth busters, and they went into stereotypes and uh, just myths around uh, the Black community and broke them down. Where did this mm -hmm. come from? How did this get started? How is it perpetuated? How is it impacting people today? And it was very profound. And some of the myths I was familiar with, but there were a couple that I, I wasn't. And one of the ones I wasn't was around um, real estate transactions and the bias that comes from assuming uh, things about people as they go through the real estate process and even questioning directly, where do your funds come from? Did you receive these funds from a large gift? And mm -hmm. what are the consequences of whether you've been gifted money or not gifted money? Mm -hmm. um, so that was fascinating. And it caused me to go do more research and more reading, which is the best part of all those types of things. Yeah. One of the many underlying reasons for um, segregation in our neighborhoods, right? So, you know, I had uh, had um, listened to a um, a program around redlining neighborhoods, and uh, just absolutely shocking. Um, somebody has uh, watched Good Trouble. Um, one uh, has said that our organization has hosted four events this Black History Month, focusing on systemic racism, the impact of COVID on our community, and a focus on our commitment to diversity and inclusion. Good for you. Um, 
attending the excellent programs being put on by our business resource groups at ADP. <laughs> Yay, Jerry. <laughs> And uh, so a uh, lot's going on at ADP, apparently, um, especially through the Black Business Resource Group, Cultivate, put on multiple events this month that were outstanding. Dr. Ian, Dr. Livingston, and many amazing internal ADP speakers. Fantastic. Oh, this is interesting. Good morning. I'm a member of the first African-American Black female search results, Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. Greek letter organization. So my local chapter has been celebrating black females every day. Fantastic. Uh, watched glory. Wow. And my rowing workout on Apple workout had a session honoring black musicians analyze words of some interesting lyrics. Fantastic. Um, I know I had my husband and I have taken to finding your roots. Um, which um, is by Henry Louis Gates Jr. course. And uh, that's been really fascinating. And to see the pain and the shame of those both white and black who have slavery in their past, uh, either as owners or um, as being actual slaves. So that's been a real eye opener for me and for us. All right. Well, uh, again, welcome everybody. Um, Let's just go ahead and get started. I want to introduce my co-hostess again, uh, Barbara Riley, um, who has agreed to facilitate today's dialogue with our special guest. Um, uh, Barbara is a, an industrial organizational psychologist, and she's got over 20 years of partnering with organizations in all kinds of areas such as change management, leadership development, learning and development strategy, talent management, um, team effectiveness and employee engagement. And uh, she's just recently taken on a significant role in the area of diversity, equity and inclusion at um, Slalom. She has been a senior consultant and an executive coach at TurkNet. And, uh, but I know her best as my favorite grad school professor. <laughs> Uh, she actually taught me uh, in, um, in grad school at Robinson College of Business in the area of organizational behavior. And actually, uh, that was uh, the catalyst for me to fall in love with this whole area. So um, I'm going to let you uh, go ahead now and introduce our remarkable guest and get started. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Anne. Yes, wonderful and delightful when Anne came to TurkNet and we got to work together in a very different capacity than the last time we had worked together as professor and student. So I am absolutely torn at this moment because I would love to spend 15 or 20 minutes digging into Jerry Genu's uh, bio, but I also want her to start speaking as soon as possible. So I'm gonna give you the highlights from my point of view. So this is not reading from a bio, but uh, she's educated by coastal, which I think is fascinating. So um, undergrad at UC Berkeley and then swapped coasts and did her law degree at New York University. So uh, covered the country, uh, did, did work uh, initially out of law school with private law firms and a lot of work in mergers and acquisitions and now works at ADP. Uh, when we first received her bio, she, her title was general counsel, but she's going to tell you a little bit about her, her new role. Um, I think Susan Hitchcock or Anne spotted her when she was tapped uh, as an honoree in the Corporate Counsel Awards for diversity and being a diversity champion. Um, one of the most interesting things I think about Jerry is that um, she lends her time and her talents and her skill to lots of different ERGs. So um, she'll tell you a little bit more about that, but she's quite supportive of the business resource groups at ADP. Um, I have to say that when we first met, I looked at her bio more than once to confirm that she was in fact an attorney because she was so kind and down to earth and intentional. Uh, I do believe she's the, the most genuine, nice, 
uh, attorney I've, I've had the privilege of, of knowing, um, one of my most challenging consulting clients was doing a strategic plan for a law firm. And when I tell you that we argued over every word, we, we truly did. <laughs> and so um, she's awesome and amazing. She gives of her time and talents. She is um, a remarkable person, uh, a wife, a mother, uh, an openly gay black female attorney. I don't, I think probably you could count those on one hand, maybe. Um, and it's my great honor to get to spend some time talking with Jerry Genu. And we'll just stick with Jerry for the rest of this session. We're going to do a rapid fire at the beginning, just so you can get to know her a little bit more than what I just offered. So a few quick paced rapid fire questions, and then we'll get into the meat of some of our leadership questions. So good morning, Jerry. Glad to have you here. Good morning, Barb. I'm delighted to be with you today. Awesome. Okay. So are you a morning person, an evening person, or perpetually on? I am a morning person for sure. So it's a good thing this was scheduled this morning. <laughs> awesome. That is great to know. What's your favorite stress reliever? Actually, I like to meditate. I've been doing that for a little awesome. over a year now, and I find that that really does relieve a lot of stress for me. Awesome. Came in handy probably this past year, I imagine. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Word or phrase that gets under your skin? Yes. Reverse discrimination. And uh, can I say more? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, that, that implies that there's a natural way to discriminate and discrimination is discrimination. There shouldn't be a natural order of uh, discriminating against one uh, particular group. So that word just gets under my skin. Okay, so when you hear it, do you correct it in the moment? Do you say, hey, let's stop and pause or how do you respond? It depends, it, it depends on the situation. One thing I've learned in life is uh, everything's situational. If, it, if the time is right, then yes, I would correct it. If I'm sitting in front of my CEO and he's doing a town hall and he said something like that, no, I would not correct that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> not that you would say that. So yes. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, favorite word. Favorite word is possibilities. Super. Um, on a scale of one to 10, how good are you at keeping secrets? I shared this question with a friend of mine uh, before when you sent that, that question over and they said, don't you know, don't they know you're an attorney? So I would say that's a 10. Uh, it's, our, it's our profession to keep our clients' confidences. So I'd say that's a 10. Awesome. Uh, would you rather climb a mountain or jump from a plane? Okay. So I have a, a fear of heights. And so uh, it depends on the mountain. If the mountain has a sufficient ledge or a lot of, uh, uh, ground around me, then I would like to climb a mountain. Otherwise, maybe no to both. <laughs> okay. A uh, place you most want to travel. Oh, that's easy. Bora Bora or Fiji. Uh, it, I've seen pictures of, of that place and uh, just seems so magical and just uplifting. And so someday I'll make it there. I was hoping to make it there this year, but with uh, everything that's happening with COVID, we'll probably have to wait a little while. Okay. Okay. Is that the place with the, um, the huts above water where you actually see down into the water? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And the, the water just seems so crystal clear and just seems so magical. So someday I'll make it there. We all can't wait for that moment. Uh, your last Halloween costume. Now this may <laughs> because Halloween this year was kind of a dud. So yeah, well, I didn't dress up this year, so the last Halloween costume would be the one from the prior year, and my colleagues will know that I dressed up as a ninja. Um, why I dressed up as a ninja, I don't know. I was just looking for things on um, the online service uh, Amazon, and I saw one, and I said, oh, okay, a ninja seems interesting. So uh, I have uh, uh, the president that I report to. Um, she she uh, encourages our, our whole senior team to dress up. And so uh, it was fun to dress up as a ninja and people were quite shocked to see that. I love that. I would, I, we have to see that photo. If you have it, <laughs> maybe you can owe it back to us. That's right. Last one, uh, last song you played on iTunes or Spotify. Um, what is that? I, I played it this morning. Let me see what it was. It was, um, Unwritten by oh. Natasha Bennington. 
I, I love songs that uh, are up, uplifting, kind of have a message, get your energy um, in a good place. And so I, I tend to listen to songs like that a lot. Awesome. Cool. I know that song. I'm singing it now in my, in my head. Great, great song for the morning. Um, since we've gotten your bio, you have a new role at ADP. So tell us a little bit about that role and the team that you're building. Absolutely, Barb. And I'll just uh, make one correction because I do have some colleagues on the phone and they heard you say that I'm the general counsel of ADP. I'm not the general counsel of ADP. I'm actually uh, the assistant general counsel. We have a, a few uh, folks in that category. But I used to lead a division of lawyers uh, or the legal team for a division. And that was wonderful. I've done that for almost nine years. And uh, most recently, I was asked to um, think about another opportunity. And I applied for an opportunity that's building a brand new team. Uh, we're calling it the Global Contracts Team. It's a uh, world, it's support, uh, global support for transactions at ADP. And what I love about this new opportunity is it's a time to do something that's, that's fresh and new. It doesn't exist. So we get to build it from the ground up. Uh, shape its future, hopefully add tremendous value to the company. And uh, that's just something that I've always loved is to be a creator, create new things and be innovative. And so this is a, a great opportunity that allows me to do that. Awesome. That is great. All right. Leadership question. Uh, what's the best leadership advice you've received in your career? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I would say this came from someone who's a very senior executive at our company, and it was it came at a time when I was um, having some some challenges. And she she said to me that what you should realize is that each moment makes a, a difference, and each moment matters. And so, when you're in the hall and you're interacting with individuals, those moments matter. And if you're at a at a conference and you have time to interact with um, your colleagues that make those moments meaningful because if that's all that they know of you, that that stays in their mind. And so it, it as I've evolved and, um, and really kind of dug into to, um, more of the personal development, I, I link that to being present, right? And so when you're present, uh, you really can make each moment matter uh, and you can be intentional in terms of how you wanna be seen in that moment or what message you wanna share with the person with whom you're speaking. And so I think that's the, the best leadership advice that I've been given. Yeah, I think even those small moments like time on an elevator or passing the hallway. Um, I remember very distinctly my last team meeting in March when I said to my team, we were sitting around a big conference table, hey, we might not be back here for a while. <laughs> wow. Let's, let's, Imagine that moment. I thought we'd be back in a couple of weeks. We've never returned to that boardroom and we never will because we've changed office space. So that, that moment, I had no idea what it meant at the time, but now looking back, saying that out loud, we may not be here for a while is quite profound. So you never know. Yeah, I, I, it's absolutely, Barbara. Um, it's, you know, I think sometimes we, we think, there's so much ahead of us, but you, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. So just taking um, advantage and in, enjoying the moments and hopefully connecting with individuals in those moments is, is critically important. Cool. Well, I know you have a lot that you could list here when I ask you, what have you been most proud of? But thinking of your entire career and what you've done, what are you most proud of? Yeah, so this may uh, shock some of the listeners today because even though it happened inside of ADP, I would say it's not directly linked to the day-to-day -day work that I do. And I, I, I will tell a story because uh, I think it, it kind of helps capture the, the picture here. I was sitting in a senior leadership meeting and our CFO at the time said, uh, after he had given his finance uh, presentation, he said, here's what we're gonna do. We're building a team, Team ADP, and we're gonna travel from Boston to New York over three days, that's 275 miles. And we're gonna do that on our bikes to raise money for, to end AIDS and to support the LGBT center in New York City in their AIDS uh, prevention and HIV awareness programs. 
And he said, who here wants to join and sign up for Team ADP? I already have Carlos, who's our CEO, signed up. And I have a number of our executive committee members signed up. And I listened to, to him and I said, is he kidding? And so he, fast forward, he came to our Women in Leadership meeting and he said the exact same thing. And so I thought to myself, this is interesting. Now, at the time, I, I didn't exercise. I didn't own a bike. And, and yet I said, hmm. Why not? So I signed up and uh, and that I think was one of the most pivotal changing moments in my life because what came from that was I started on this journey. Uh, the first thing I had to do is get a bike. And uh, so I got a bike, I, I connected with a couple of colleagues and we decided to train together. And, um, and so I looked at the training program and the first uh, the first thing on the program was, it was like five or 10 mile ride. So I get my bike out, I go into my neighborhood and I start, you know, cycling. I say, this is going to be great. And I, I, no joke, Barb, I, I got maybe a half a mile out there and I was over the hands of the handlebar gasping for air, thinking oh. to myself, what did I get myself into? Right. Uh, but, but over the time, what I realized was that you just have to form a plan. And so with my uh, friends, we, we started to train together. We got, I got a coach to put together a plan and it was a step-by-step -step process. And over time, um, I was able to build up my endurance. And, and then I, I did the ride the first year. I, uh, the, the minimum raise was uh, $3,000, but I was fortunate um, to be able to raise $12,000 that year. And um, I couldn't believe it. It was like a, just a life-changing moment. And what that's done for, for me is um, the, the next year I, I, I signed up again. And the third year I was asked to co-captain the team. And so we actually were able to recruit over 20 riders from the Atlanta area to go up and participate in this event. And I will tell you that, and, and as I would pitch and recruit people for this event, I would tell them this is a life-changing event for you. And not only is it life-changing for you, but we are we are literally helping to save lives by helping the center with their HIV and AIDS uh, programs, and the journey that people have gone on by jumping in like I had done and participating in something like that. It's just incredible to see. I had someone who was a, a triathlete who uh, said, "I don't know if I can do this, not because I the the ride itself. It was the money." Everybody has something, right? Everybody has something that they're fearful of or they think they can't do. And so I, I said, all you have to do is find 50 ADP associates who will donate, you know, or 30 ADP associates who will donate $50 because of the match, then that's, you'll get there. And he's like, oh, okay, if I break it down that way, that makes sense. And he blew out his fundraising goal in a few days. And so it's just all about sometimes jumping in, believing you can do it and uh, taking the plunge. And I think for, for ADP, you know, we've, we've been participating now for about four years and we've raised almost $2 million in support of those efforts. And so as I think about like what I'm most proud at at work, it's that, it's that community involvement. It's, it's able to give back to the community. It's also the ability to help others uh, grow and do things that they never thought they could do. Um, and so that's really impactful because that bleeds into so many other areas of your life, not just uh, something like the ride, but how you show up at work and, and how you live your life. That's amazing. That's awesome. What advice do you have for a brand new biker? Let's say someone gets inspired by your conversation today and goes and grabs that bike. What's your best biking advice? Now that's, uh, I would say to find uh, some other cyclists. There are so many cycling groups in the Atlanta area. And even now with, with COVID, they're still meeting, they try to social distance and things, but just being able to get out there and, and do that kind of an event with, or you know, just learn how to cycle with other people, you learn so much from, from people who are also cyclists. And there's so many different groups from the beginners. I would definitely say, look for a beginner group <laughs> so, that, so that you can survive and not be left behind. But, but yeah, that would be my advice is just to find some others to, to enjoy cycling and, and, and jump in. And don't be too hard on yourself, by the way, because, you know, like I said, it's when I first got out there, I didn't cycle. And now I, I consider myself a pretty good cyclist. Uh, but, you know, you learn. It takes it one step at a time to, to learn. That's awesome. And I love that a person planted a seed for you and then you continued to plant that seed for others. 
So just think about that distribution network of getting others involved and bringing them, creating life-changing experiences for everyone. Absolutely. That's awesome. Well, we talked a little bit about um, finding your voice and your journey to finding that voice that I would say is the sweet spot between confidence and arrogance. Um, can you talk a little bit about the journey to finding your voice? I can. Uh, so the uh, I remember the day, and I had the day written down. It was June, I believe it was 2014. I think it was June 26. Uh, I was on the phone with my manager, and uh, I had been a stellar performer at ADP uh, as a lawyer, and uh, I was part of an executive team at that time. And he said, Jerry, you're, you're a great lawyer, but as an executive, we have some opportunities here. And, and uh, he said, I tell you what, you've got 60 days to turn things around. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? So, uh, you know, I, so I got some feedback. It wasn't received very well in the moment. You know, I actually had to, to go home that day and I, I literally shed some tears and I called a, a coach that I've been coaching with for, for many years and said, I don't understand this. And, and, and then I, um, I got back in touch with my manager and he said, we're going to work through this together and we're going to get you a coach um, to help you, you know, on this path. And that was really helpful because what happened in that moment is that the coach went and solicited some feedback from some of my peers in terms of opportunities, my strengths, all those things. She asked a great question though. She, she asked everyone who, with whom she met, how can you support Jerry in, in her journey? Right. Because I think sometimes people may look outside and, and be critical of, of people, but are they really kind of thinking about how they can support that individual? And so we put together a plan and one element on that plan was to, to just ha show your voice and speak your voice and find your voice and, um, and, and to think about when you're in meetings or when you're asked your opinion or even when you're not asked your opinion to, to speak up and not hesitate and question yourself. And so that has really helped tremendously just uh, knowing that my opinion and my voice matters and, and I don't have to wait for permission to, to speak it. I can actually provide it and it doesn't have to be just on legal matters. I, I consider myself a business person with a legal background. Um, I happen to also have a, an MBA and, and uh, you don't need an MBA though to speak on, on business matters, but I just, uh, it, it just, I, I found empowerment in, in going through that journey. And, and so fast forward, uh, you know, the, the individuals who were giving me the feedback about the executive presence and and just showing up in a different way, uh, they said I you know they couldn't believe the, how I had transformed and uh, and so uh, I that's that was eight or nine years ago and so I'm still thriving. So I just I, I use that as an example for people that sometimes when you're you're given um, difficult feedback that you know, sit with it and, and think about it. Because at the time when I, um, when, when I saw the, the written um, feedback from the coach, the, the interviews, I didn't think some of those things were true. But as I allowed myself to, to experience that, I, I started to witness where I was doing some of the things that were in the feedback. And so by that awareness, I was, I was um, n now I had a, a, a path to make some changes. That is awesome. There's so much in there that I want to, to reflect on. One is like that feedback, seeing it and saying, well, that's not me. Like, that's not who I am. And as an executive coach, I've sat across the table from so many people who've had that initial reaction. And the ones who really take it to heart are the, we have a conversation where I say, how would you behave if it were true? Like, let's, let's just pretend it's true. What would you do? And, and they start going on, well, if that was true, I would do this and this and this and this. Okay, what will it hurt you to do those things? I love that. <laughs> so it's like, it gets rid of that shock and awe. Um, the other thing is, I think sometimes people think, oh, everyone has smooth sailing. I'm sure there were people on this call that thought, oh, Jerry, it just, you know, probably went here, 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 just a continual trajectory and those stop your tracks moments, like I cannot imagine someone saying to me, you have 60 days to turn this around. I, that would scare the crud out of me. And, but taking that moment and saying, 
I can do a lot in 60 days. I can figure this out and I'll figure it out. And you did. Um, And And growing up. Yeah. And it wasn't that, you know, I had to kind of transform in 60 days, but I had to make meaningful progress or in, and, uh, and you're right. I love that. It, like, what it, what would you do if it were true? That's excellent. I, I'm going to use that actually. <laughs> so, thank you for that tip. Um, so, so, but, uh, but yeah, it was a, it was a journey for sure. It didn't, you know, the transformation didn't happen just in 60 days. But there was enough meaningful change that people were ready to, to be in there with me to, to see continue on in that journey. So, um, yeah, I, I love that. I love it too. I l- also love the piece about having allies, you know, and saying, okay, what will be your role? How will you support this journey? How will you support Jerry? I, that's such a key thing. I think, you know, we have coaches, mentors, sponsors, but the most meaningful times is when I've gone up to someone in my career and said, can you be my ally? I think I need an ally here. And, and then we have a conversation about it. And never once has someone said, no, I don't think I can be your ally. <laughs> You're asking the right people. So, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's so true. It, it's like, uh, you know, you always hear people say it's not what they're, it's what they're saying about you when you're not there, right? It's the people who are saying, why don't we give Jerry or so-and-so this opportunity, right? When you're not in the room, that makes a meaningful difference. And, uh, and so you, you never know what, what folks are saying until, you know, so getting those allies who can speak up for you and, and have your back. We had a, a session at, at Women in Leadership and uh, our, our presenter was saying that we need a wing woman, right? And so I, I feel like I have that. I feel like I have that amongst some of my colleagues who are, who are really close friends. I think a, a couple of them were on this call uh, and, uh, and, and they'll tell you the truth, right? You need people who will speak the truth to you and not sugarcoat it. Um, and you know, they're doing it out of love and you can spark each other on and, and spar each other on to, to greater things. Uh, but you certainly need those allies at all different levels. You need people who are at, you know, above you, you need people on your sides and you need people who even you, re, you re, who report to you to be your allies as well. So I, I love that. That's amazing. I am reminded of, um, you know, that personal advisory board, like just having that, that team around you. And I know when we talked, it was clear that your that your wife is a member of that team and that you have used coaches along the way that probably have been members of your personal advisory board. Who else is in that group? Yeah, so um, it, I would say I have uh, I have a couple folks, uh, well, not a couple, but the, the the two women who did the ride with me that first year, we, we call ourselves the three amigas. I, I definitely reach out to them um, periodically for advice and input. And, you know, we text each other and spur each other on. And then I have a couple of, uh, of colleagues who are really, really close to me. Uh, they happen to also be African-American women. Uh, they're not gay, but we won't hold that against them. Um, but uh, <laughs> they, they're, they're great too, because especially when you're in the room with, people and they can see you and they, and so you can ask, was that a little sharp or how did that come across? And you can get that kind of real time feedback from, from someone who's, who's going to tell you the truth. So um, I'd say they're in my, my advisory board as well. And then I have, uh, you know, cyclists and, and friends that, uh, that I just socialize with. Uh, they, they're not in my profession, but they could still certainly provide input on things uh, that are meaningful. So. Awesome. I love that. So this has been uh, quite a year in many ways. Um, There has been a considerable focus this year on diversity, race, inclusion, equity at work. Um, You mentioned that from the get-go on your resume, you were uh, openly gay, out, uh, wanted to make that clear as, as you were looking for work and people were thinking about hiring you. It's not a secret. Um, you've been obviously a role model for many, um, but how has your, how is your worldview seeing through the wor- the eyes of a, an openly gay black female executive, how has that shaped your work experience? Yeah, so, um, I would say that, you know, being someone who's in a kind of non-majority group, 
Um, I don't I don't like the word minority. Uh, I think we we talked about that because it it makes it seem as though the group is not as important. So, you know, words have meaning. So I'm, I'm very careful. Maybe it's because I'm a lawyer. I don't know, but I'm very careful about the words that I use. So, you know, being a person of color, uh, being openly gay, it definitely has shaped my experiences. Um, I've, I, like a lot of people, you know, face unconscious bias. And I, I see it um, in, in terms of, well, people make a, a, a assessments and, and assumptions, right? So uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, when I first was uh, promoted into my, my leadership role, I, I went to one of my first uh, senior meetings and I was talking to a, a colleague and automatically he said, oh, you're, you're the na in national accounts legal. Oh, so you report to so-and-so. And I said, no, actually he reports to me. <laughs> And, uh, it, you know, but he made the assumption because he was a man. I think it was because he was a man and because he was tall. You know, there's there's these unconscious biases. <laughs> He's a, a Caucasian man. Uh, but uh, and I, I know there have been many times when I was in the legal profession at the law firm and we would be working on deals and you'd come into the room to close a deal and the other side would say, oh, can you uh, help us with that, uh, get those papers sorted? I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> because they assumed that, you know, you're the paralegal, right? I've had other uh, colleagues tell me, uh, a colleague who was at a, at a firm, and uh, he came, he went down, he was working on a Saturday to get some food, and he left his his keys up at, in, in his office, and one of his uh, one of the associates was like, I didn't order any Chinese food, right? Like just made the assumption because he is an Asian Asian man um, coming in on a Saturday. And so I think we, we face these kinds of situations and we have a choice in terms of how we react in the moment. And, and I often use those moments to what I hope is educating folks. Um, we had a situation once where we were talking about um, you know, succession planning and uh, and it, not necessarily at ADP, but we were talking about succession planning. And it was interesting because people kept saying, oh, well, this person is ready now, you know, and, and they would say that. And there was a you could see a thread in terms of uh, who was ready now, even though they had skill gaps in their resume. But for the women, they would say, well, they're not ready for that role because of this, this and this. Right. And so after after that session, I reached out to our HR and I said, did you see like a a, uh, a trend there in terms of com some of the, the, the comments that people were making is in terms of who who could be ready now, even though they had some gaps and who who needed to kind of get another assignment before they could assume a role. And uh, and, and so the next day I, I shared with the team, I just want to po point out an observation. Um, I don't know what's driving this, but I, I'm just seeing sort of a correlation here. And maybe we should explore that. And and you know, candidly, I I, I try to, to believe the best in people. So I don't know that that was intentional, but it was happening. And when you're in the room in those moments and you notice those things, I, I think it's important to, to point them out. And so I I see, you know, being an openly gay African American woman as um, you know, I, I I feel like I have an obligation when I see things to point them out, but to do it in a way that people can receive it. Because if you do it in a way that's too confrontational, you're you're just gonna um, push people away. And you need allies, like that we were talking about. You need you need people who are not like you uh, to support the work in this D D E and I area. So, um, yeah, I, I, that's what I would say. I have tons of stories, but I know we have other <laughs> questions to get to. Other topics. Yeah. Um, how has that shaped how you choose cultures of where you want to work and looking carefully at the types of organizations you want to work for and maybe those that you don't? Oh, it, it makes a huge difference for me in terms of where I want to be. If, if I am not at a, at a company that is welcoming to people of color, to women, uh, to people who are gay, I don't want to work there. Life is too short. And so that's why on my resume, I had that I was part of the, the Bisexual Gay and Lesbian Law Students Association when I first came out of school, because I, I and that, by the way, having that on your resume doesn't mean that you are, because you could be an ally. We had allies in the organization, but there was a chance, right? And so um, I, I think it's really important to be in those environments uh, so that you can be yourself. 
and not feel like you're hiding something um, because that that type of work is is exhausting. You know, we all we already have to sometimes pivot and as they say, code shift, right? Um, and to add additional layers um, is is just not, you know. So I, I'm careful about where I work. I'm also careful about the products that I use and the businesses that I, you know, um, will choose to, to patronize. And uh, so, uh, and, and I'm really pleased to be at ADP because, you know, ADP has, we say that each person counts and we do a lot of programming and we'll probably get into some of that later that really supports that, uh, but that I'm very deliberate. And I encourage other people to be deliberate about where they where they work too. It, it should really fit and they shouldn't have to uh, leave part of themselves you know, at the door when they go to work. Life is too short. That's awesome. That's awesome. I appreciate that. I also appreciate you talking about noticing something, saying something, but figuring out a way that works. Um, we had an instance just the other day where we were building a slate for people to go to a leadership academy. And there was a, a great, awesome young female leader. And one of the male executives said, I don't think we should send her to this academy right now. She has a lot on her plate. She's a new mother. She's just coming back. She has a big project. And, and I said, Oh, I hear that. Yeah, she's so busy and she's got a lot going on, and, but she is an amazing leader and we are trying to build female leaders. Why don't we ask her, you know, why don't we just ask her how she feels about it and at least figure it out. What I was thinking is stop making decisions for people without talking to them, right? And then I started to do the math and I thought, okay, let's just say there's a hundred such conversations like this happening all over our 8,000 employee base. And then at the end of the year, we say, oh, we don't have enough female leaders in this leadership, you know, journey. And, and we go, and that's, that's how it happens. It, it's innocent. It's one conversation at a time. It's a micro behavior. But if someone's not there to hold up a mirror and just okay. very nicely, but very directly, there's another path. Or can we think about this differently? Or let's look at the conversation we just had. And was it equitable? Did we really? treat those two people equitably. No, we didn't. We didn't say that about a single male, although many of them had had children during that same time frame. So I love that you figure out a way to, to point it out um, in a way that people can receive it. So I do want to talk about where you're here because if you're working in corporate social responsibility and in in the BRGs, the ADP supports and your active role in many uh, a BRG. So do you, want, do you want to talk about that a little bit and share what ADP is doing? Yeah. So um, for, for co corporate social responsibility perspective, <clears throat> we encourage all of our associates to support the communities in which they live. And so, you know, the, the cycle for the cause, which I've already shared about is one area where we've had, you know, a number of associates participate over the years, uh, the American Heart walk is another thing that we participate in. Um, but what it's just something, it doesn't matter really what the cause is. It, the, the point is that um, that's part of our values for, to, to reach out into our communities and support our communities. And so I, I love the fact we give our associates eight hours a year to take time to do something in the community. Um, most of our BRGs uh, have a community uh, service element that's uh, a part of it. Uh, so that's what I would say about corporate social responsibility. I would say on the, on the diversity side, in terms of the BRGs, we have over 10 BRGs at ADP um, and we, we work collaboratively together. I'm privileged to be part of uh, the Cultivate. I'm on the steering committee for Cultivate. We just finished a, an amazing uh, program, series of programs for uh, Black History Month. Uh, the Cultivate chair happens to be on the call. Uh, today, but it was just, it was phenomenal to, to have the, the programming. We, we brought in Dr. Ian Smith to talk about how, uh, you know, COVID has disproportionately impacted the African-American community. We had some of our, our um, African-American leaders, uh, most of them had been here under a year uh, on a panel discussion just yesterday, and the stories that they were telling were, were awesome and really got you to think. I, we have our chief economist who actually appears on CNBC from time to time. And she was uh, sharing with us how 
the African American ownership hasn't changed in since 1968, like the percentage of African Americans who own homes, right? This is the biggest way in which to create wealth is home ownership. And to see that not change, there's there's systematic things that are embedded here. And so anyway, the fact that we had this panel and you had our CEO on, our GC on, you know, many of our executives on just to hear kind of the stories and, and hear uh, people's journeys, I, I think is part of the solution, right? To to just understand what happens in, in other communities. Uh, so, so that's awesome. And then as a chair of women in leadership, it's just, uh, I'm so privileged to be in the role. Uh, I've been in the role for about a year. And uh, one of the things that I'm really focused on um, is, is uh, supporting our, our women and lifting them up. And so this past year, we had a masterclass series called Unleash the Power of You. And we brought in um, industry and thought leaders. Uh, we had a focus on our health, on resiliency, leading through crisis. Uh, and uh, it's just been a, a privilege to be part of that. And then I'm an active participant in Pride through the, the cycle for the cause. I'm on that steering committee as well. So, you know, there, there's so many ways in which we can lean in at ADP and support our associates and our communities. And uh, that's that's something that I, I just really enjoy as uh, I, as part of my job. It, it really brings a lot of a lot of joy. That's awesome. Can you talk a little bit about the allies that attend these events? I mean, you mentioned having your top leaders come and show up. Um, how how do you do that? How do you how do you build that energy and build that momentum to make it easy for allies to to show up and be supportive? Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, you have to invite them <laughs> because candidly, like we, we did a, a will meeting a couple years ago and it wasn't until like the last minute that we said, hey, we should invite some men. And so we, we decided we weren't going to do it that year because it was too late. But then the next year we said, let's be intentional and let's figure out who we want to invite. And we decided we wanted to invite influencers and, and decision makers. And, and so this uh, this past year when we did our will meeting, we invited everyone who reported to an executive committee member. Who So all of those very senior men um, participated in our in our meeting. And so they could hear, you know, some of the stories and the challenges. We had a, a panel of our executive uh, women um, and they were just talking about, you know, some of the, the things that they had to face in their careers. And I think just hearing those conversations for people provides awareness. Um, I, I, um, I had the privilege to speak on a panel a couple years ago. It was on male allies. So I invited my whole team and one of the members of my team, I thought he was just going to stay for my, my presentation. He ended up staying the whole day and he was, he was, an, he's an African-American man. And he said, I did not know that women faced some of these, these, these things. And I have like girls and I, I want to make sure I, I, I can equip them for some of the challenges that they're gonna face. And he could relate to some things being a person of color, but I think it's really making sure you reach out and invite them to the conversation and let them hear kind of the dialogue. And, and that creates uh, you know the learning opportunities. And then the other piece is we've done a lot of ally building across the different groups. So um, even on this, um, we, this panel for Cultivate, we had you know, members of Pride, we had members of Adelante, which is uh, our, uh, you know, our, our uh, Latinx BRG. And we just try to kind of go across the different groups and, and build that allyship. That's amazing. That is awesome. I, um, I've been thinking a lot, we've been talking, and I, I keep hearing in the chat and seeing in the chat. So I have to acknowledge the chats that popped up. That have um, that speak to your presence at ADP and your leadership, and as you were talking about, we just have to invite them. Somebody uh, put in the chat, they're coming because Jerry is amazing, or something like that. <laughs> that you're an attractor too. That a big part of that is you, your involvement in attracting people to that. Well, that's that's really nice. Um, the, the word equity has gotten a lot of a play recently. Um, for some people, equity sounds like a very reasonable assumption. And for other people, the word equity sounds scary. So can you talk a little a bit about what equity means to you and how you 
uh, seek to uh, demonstrate and show equity at, at work? Yeah, I think for me, equity is, is giving everyone an equal uh, shot at things. And that doesn't mean that it's so, so, so there's this picture uh, that Dr. Livingston, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's uh, at Harvard and he came and did a session at ADP and he showed this picture of, is this equity or is this equity? And, and one of the pictures were these people at different heights uh, trying to look over a fence, right? And, you know, equality was giving everybody the same height of stool kind of the step and yet the short person can't see over it because you know they're short um and the tall person can see way over it so you don't need everybody to have that same height what you need is everybody have equal opportunity so you know sometimes you have to make systematic or structural changes because of what we've been talking about with respect to unconscious bias that permeates you know society and institutions right not it's not necessarily a particular institution's fault it's just how these organizations have grown up over time um and so what, what i'll say is i'm really excited that uh, ADP is on a journey. Um, last year, we did a lot of the kind of conversational piece, bringing in Dr. Livingston to different sites to talk to the leaders. Uh, that gave the awareness. He's awesome. He pro provides a lot of uh, science behind the, the inequities, right? Um, and it was eye-opening to some of the leaders to, to hear that you have a, a better chance of getting a job if you're um, white and a criminal than you do if you're a black man, right? And that's because of the studies, right? Um, and so, so from that though, um, after what's happened tragically in society last year with the deaths of, of so many uh, black Americans, uh, ADP went on a journey um, to, to really look at what we could do in a broader way. And, and so we, we formed a task force that's really focused on providing equity for Latinx and African-American associates. And what we're looking at is, does our leadership mirror the population of ADP and, mm -hmm. and a journey to make it mirror, right? To, to, to reach equity there. Um, and so, you know, looking at promotions, looking at, um, you know, leadership development, looking at retention, all of that, making it sure you have an inclusive environment. So mm -hmm. we're, we're putting investment behind that. And it's not just seated with, the D, D, I, D, E, and I office, there are people, there are business leaders that are part of that, right? And so I think that's really important. Um, you know, an, another thing that, you know, we've done is we signed up to be part of the 110th. I don't know if you're 110, I think, it's, if you're familiar with it, 37 companies. We were part of the first 37 companies to sign up. Uh, Ken Frazier, uh, the former CEO of Merck, uh, had, with a, with a few other people, started this organization really focused on in the next 10 years, providing um, sustaining jobs, like wage sustaining jobs for a family, like you could actually live off of these wages uh, for uh, 1 million black Americans, right? And, and to look beyond even, do people have the education? Like let's help them get the education and let's help them get into the roles and help them to get developed skills to, you know, to, to get promoted and, and, uh, sustained. So I was I was really happy to see that we signed up to be one of those uh, um, signing members. And then I would say from a legal perspective, we also dug in and um, we did an initiative and we did a fundraising campaign for the Equal Justice Initiative because we said, oh, you know, we're lawyers, we should do something that's <laughs> related to the law and the NAACP. And it was just great to see the energy in our organization. Um, we're also making some efforts intentionally across the board, but specifically in, in the legal uh, group to look at, you know, the law firms that we use and our, how, what's the makeup of the law firms and to make sure that we uh, provide some, in, you know, incentive by telling our law firms, hey, we care about, you know, diversity and inclusion. And if everyone who's on our matters looks the same way, it's not a good thing, right? So, um, and I'm, you know, Coca-Cola is, is really a front runner there in terms of what they're doing. But um, but there's a lot of ways in which you can support equity. Um, and so that's what we're doing as an organization. And I'm, I'm certainly supporting that in, um, in, the, in the spaces that I operate. Awesome, great answer. Thank you so much. I think the story is going to be, the story of the decade is gonna unfold around inclusion, diversity and equity. And 
I'm glad you're going to be part of that that story. Um, at, at TurkNet, we talk about leadership character a lot. Uh, we talk about character shaping moments, so moments in your life where uh, your character is shaped and formed. Um, can you talk a little bit about some character shaping moments in your life? I can. Um, I'm going to share two. The first is is work related. Uh, it was um, I don't remember the exact year now, but <clears throat> I was involved in a BPI project, business process innovation project, and um, we had done this assessment part of the project to figure out what are the opportunities from a contracting side. And it was cross-functional. We had finance, sales, business leaders as part of this uh, effort. And so after we did this assessment, there was the, we had identified a couple of projects coming from that and they were looking for people to lead the projects. And, and so I was in the room at the time and I was having these kind of side conversations with my uh, manager at the time and say, hey, you know, who should, you know, who should lead this project and stuff. And, um, and I said, I think I'm going to raise my hand to do that. Um, and it was a, that was a pivotal moment in my career because, and it was a risky moment because a, I didn't have the time. <laughs> so like, I had a full job. I had a team to lead. I had a lot of responsibility. And this was kind of a side project, right? Uh, but what I've realized is that when the moments are there, you need to seize the opportunity because you don't know when the next one will come. Sometimes mm -hmm. there's not going to be the perfect moment for those opportunities and they don't come about every day. But what that opportunity did for me was it um, allowed me to have a lot more visibility at the you know, C-suite level. Um, it, and what I, but I knew it was gonna be a make or break moment in my career. It's like, if this goes well, this is gonna be really good for me. If this doesn't go well, I should probably update my resume. <laughs> and it, it was one of those types of, uh, types of moments and, and, and opportunities. And I just, I said, you know what? I'm a little fearful here, but I got to do it. I, I got to do this. And you know, I talked to my wife and said, I'm about to take on this project. It's going to mean more time away. I'm going to have to travel. Um, I'm going to not sleep a lot over the course of the next nine months or so, but I think it's a really important thing and I think I can make a, an impact. And so um, that was one. And uh, would you allow me to share the, the second? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so, so the, the second one is, um, surprise, a cycling story. Um, so this was, uh, <laughs> this was the second year that I did uh, cycle for the cause. And uh, this was like the longest ride ever on, this, on the second day. Um, and, and so we started, the, the first day went fine. The second day we started, I looked down and I had a flat. And we were gonna, we were gonna have to go 115 miles that day and 7,500 feet of climbing. And one of the things with you're a cyclist, it's actually easier to ride if you're riding behind other people. So you really try to find people who ride at your pace so you don't have to exert as much effort. And to know that you were gonna have to do 115 miles meant I need to stay with my pack, right? But I couldn't because I had a flat. So, you know, I caught up to the pack um, and I got through that day. It was tough, but it was like one pedal at, at a time. So then the next day comes and this is like, oh, this is easy. This is the last day. It's completely flat terrain. Um, I was riding along. Uh, our CFO was out front and it was like a long uh, group of us in this, what they call a pace line. And um, we're riding along and I was like, this is great. We're going to get in like two hours ahead of time to the holding pen and we'll just be able to hang out. And then all of a sudden I hear this. I was like, oh, who, who got a flat? Who got a flat? And I looked down and it, and it was me. I was like, oh my gosh. And luckily my colleagues stopped and, and helped me change my flat. Um, and so then we were back on the road and we get into the Bronx. We were about eight miles away, had filled up the tire a full at the, at the last pit stop. We, get, we pull out and we're like, okay, it's time to go. Eight miles left. And all of a sudden I hear this boom. And it was like a gun shooting. And I was like, what in the, and my tire had exploded, completely shredded. And I, and I was like, oh my gosh. So I told the folks I was riding with, go ahead, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'll just uh, call the sweet man. And so I called the sweet man and I, I started to tear up a bit. And I, I called my wife because they come up and try to watch me, they watch me go across the finish line. And I said, I don't think you guys are gonna see me go across the finish line. My son and my wife are there and, and my brother lives in the city. 
And I was like, why? So, well, my, my, my tire exploded. There's nothing, there's nothing I could do. And she's like, okay, well, you know, they have those city bikes around. You can grab on one of those. I was like, well, I said, well, that's a good idea, but let me see what I, you know, let me see. So I get off the phone and I called the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the sweet man. And I looked down at my watch and I was like, you know what? We have two hours left before we ride into the finish line. And, you know, so I, I get on my phone and I look for a bike shop and it was Sunday in the Bronx. There was a bike shop that had opened. I, I, when the sweet van comes, I said, I don't want you to take me to the holding pin. I want you to drop me off at the bike shop. And, uh, and they said, I don't know about that. I said, trust, I, I'm okay. I said, I'll, I'll be fine. And so I convinced them to drop me off at the bike shop and uh, they repaired my tire. And so then I was explaining to the, the, uh, the person at the bike shop what I was doing and I needed to get back on the route. And he was trying to describe where I could catch the route. So he comes out of the store and he, um, he, we're looking at the map. And, and as I turn my head, I see this, this orange arrow and it, what the orange arrow signified was the route. So <laughs> I had found a bike shop unbeknownst to me right there outside of the route. So I was able to, and literally I was tearing up again this time, like I was so, tears of joy. So I was able to get back on the route and, and head in and, uh, and, and I was able to cross the finish line. Uh, and so I, I say that as a story because for me, it's um, how you do anything is how you do everything. And I know that as we go through life, you know, we face obstacles, we, we're pushed down, we're knocked down, we don't have the right team, you know, we don't have the right funding, we, we don't feel like we have the right skills, uh, something goes wrong. And from I, I just know that for me, it's, it's all about resilience and you know you're gonna face obstacles and how do you face those obstacles is, is the important thing. You know, do you find a solution or do you wallow in the, in the challenge? And so that to me was, um, you know, a defining moment um, to continue to meet my commitment and just to find a way, you know, where there's a will there, there's a way. So that was, that was a, a, a great time. That's amazing. So did you make that second phone call and say, I'm coming across the finish yeah, I did. I did. I did. And I also had that other idea that my wife shared because they have these little rent-a-bike kind of things. I was like, oh, maybe I should do that. <laughs> you know, so that was my backup plan if I couldn't uh, change my tire. So, uh, but yeah, that was, uh, yeah, I did. I, and they were so happy uh, to, to see me cross the finish line. That is amazing. It's such a good, a good message, I think, to, you know, it is a character shaping moment when you when you just go, okay, what I have choices here. What are my choices? You know, I could, so I go to the holding pin, which is going to be totally depressing. It's all, all the people who have been swept, or I can just do everything I can to get through this and figure it out. Um, I even think your story would be just as impressive if the bike shop was closed, you know, and just thinking about at least I tried, you know, at least I made the effort and didn't just accept accept my fate. Um, I completely agree. I, I, that's so awesome. I, I appreciate you saying that. It's like, at the end of the day, we have to reflect and say, did I do all that I could do, right? And, uh, and so I completely agree. That is great. Well, this next question, I know the answer to, and I've been really excited to ask of you um, because you blew me away when I asked you this casually and it's been on my mind ever since. So, uh, what are you looking forward to? So it's 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 funny, Barb, because I uh, I was talking to a one of my wing women, and I said, should I sh should I share this? People are going to think I'm I'm flat out crazy to say this, but it's truly something. So I, first, I'll start by saying, and this is going to give you um, one more little story, and then I know we're going to open up for questions. But um, you know, I I went to a, an event we had sponsored something called at know your value and it's uh and so we had we had went to this event and at the event uh mika brzezinski was was asking people to to get up and share their like elevator speech their why and i was there with a colleague who was very senior colleague and she looked at me and she said well what's your why like what is your speech and i said um i don't know that's a good question. I've been thinking about that. She's like, well, you better get on that. And so, uh, so, so I had been reflecting upon that and I was like, what is my why, you know, why am I here? 
the, 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 you know, the here <laughs> on this earth. And, uh, and it came to me as I continued to reflect and meditate and pray and think. And, um, and what it is, is helping people reveal and achieve what is infinitely possible. And, and I really feel like everything I've done with Cycle for the Cause, everything I've done with you know, contracting improvements, and it's just my why. It's I, I, I find this energy of around, like, let's not accept what we see. Let's envision what could be, right? And, and help people envision that as well. So, so um, with that, about a year and a half ago, I was reflecting on uh, what's, what's a, a big goal that I could aspire to, to do? What's something just outlandish? And, uh, and I said, you know what would be outlandish would be to help 2 million people uh, in, that, in that moment of you know, achieving, uh, you know, revealing and achieving what is infinitely possible. And so I'm still figuring out how that's gonna show up candidly. I think it's not about just about me. There's some things we're doing and, and some programming we're thinking about at our company that I think could help me add to that number. Um, I had put a, a goal that it would happen by the time I reached my 50th birthday. And candidly, whether or not it happens by 50, I'm still going to strive to do that. But I haven't yet given up on 50. That's this year. So, uh, but, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. I, I definitely want to continue to, to live into that because it was put on my heart. And I think it can show up in a lot of different ways. Um, but uh, I really do feel like the reason I'm here is to support others. And, you know, um, th that's, th you know, doc there's a quote from uh, Martin Luther King that really resonates with me and, um, you know, about the, the greatest calling is, is your service to others. And so that's, that's my future, uh, figuring out how that, that shows up and, and, and how I can uh, live into that. Amazing. So since you said that, you know, if someone tells me a goal, I'm going to do everything I can to help them reach their goal. So I've been obsessing over your goal, which is a great oh. And I've done a little math. So let's just say there are right now at this moment, there are 60 people on this call, 60 people that have heard your wisdom today. Uh, they've been resonating in the chat saying the pieces that they're going to take away. So let's just say that those 60 people are moved in a significant way to change something about the way they think, feel, act, whatever. And all you have to do is tell five people. So you 60 people out there, you figure out what your story is, what your message is, what you learned today from Jerry that you can share. And all you have to do is five people. That's a pretty big thing. You could probably do that by five o'clock today. And then you have to convince them through the power of numbers that they need to tell five people. And I know you're persuasive, smart, intelligent, brilliant women who can share some message and then tell them why it's important to share. If that happens and it continues to happen after seven cycles, just seven cycles of that, we'll be at 4.6 million. We'll have wildly gone over Jerry's estimation of impacting 2 million. But if, if you do the math and do seven times, then 4.6 million people will benefit from, from Jerry's words today. And I believe in social networking, I believe in the power of a social network. And there's a lot of data out there. Um, Chris Stockos wrote a great book on the fact that, you know, your friends, friends, friends can make you fat. You know, if you hang out with your friends, 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 up to six connections can impact you as a person. So it's not that much to ask. Figure it out. Figure out who you're going to talk to, what you're going to share with them, and then convince them to share with five people. And you're going to meet your goal. Thank you so much, Barb. I'm, I'm like tearing up here because it's like... <laughs> I hadn't really done the math like that. And I appreciate that. So thank you all <laughs> for sharing one <laughs> nugget of wisdom with your friends and asking them to share. Now that's awesome. Awesome. Well, we are gonna come back for one final question, but I think it's time to go to Q&A and Anne is gonna help monitor that Q&A process. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll quit talking just for a little bit and go off video. So Anne can run the floor. So Jerry, 
this has been profound. And uh, so no wonder, uh, I'm sure you're not just the only one that's reaching for a Kleenex right now. Um, <laughs> it has been amazingly profound and impactful on a number of people. The comments have been amazing. And, I'll, and I just want to share with you a couple of them because I know you haven't had time to look at them. But uh, for those of us, uh, those who are listening, please, please enter your questions into the chat area or the Q&A area so that we can um, um, pose those before Jerry and get her further wisdom. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to read to you, this was around uh, your description of how each moment matters and each interaction matters. Um, one person I believe who must be from ADP said, Jerry, the way you think about the little moments is so true. Uh, those moments truly have an impact on people early in their career. It builds trust with us and it's encouraging to have a successful person even acknowledge us. So amazing. I can attest some of those moments can change the trajectory of one's career. So being present and intentional is so key. Um, and there was one comment about how developing it is and how your intentionality around um, each interaction and around the, um, uh, the moments that you spend with people um, has been also really helpful in their development. So I'm wondering, uh, until we get some more questions from our, our group, uh, how, how do you go about developing the people on your team? Is there anything in particular that uh, sets your leadership development apart from others? Well, I appreciate the question. Um, I, I think there may be one or two people on my team on the call unless they had to, to, to drop. Uh, so, uh, but what I think about for each person is, is I, I think about them, right? I don't think there's one kind of approach for every, every person. Um, and so it's really what, what they need and um, kind of, I really ask folks, like, what is it that you want? <laughs> you know, because it's like, not everybody wants the same thing. And as, as uh, you know, as Barb was sharing, we can't assume that people want what we want for them or what other people think they want. Not everybody wants to get promoted. Not everybody wants to, uh, certain jobs. So um, asking, you know, what, what people want and then Helping them get there if there are gaps is uh, it's something important. And being in a leadership role, you can influence that. You can put people on projects that help them get exposure. Uh, you can provide feedback. And so I just think it's just really helping people on their own journey. That's that's how I see my my leadership style. And and um, and then you know sometimes challenging them to think a little bigger, candidly. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Sure. Sure. Well, and. Um, the fact that you are such a strong leader and people do imitate their leaders, uh, that alone has got to be a great source of development. Yeah. Uh, we have a question about the pandemic. What has been your biggest challenge that has risen from the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah. So um, I've been fortunate enough to not have had too many of my uh, family members impacted by it. Um, in a, in a, I mean, they have, I've had family members get it, but they, they were able to recover quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say for me personally, it's been just the, the mom factor of when everything was on lockdown and um, it was really challenging. I mean, I have, we have a son here. You can see part of him, uh, his head's cut off. There you can see the whole son. Anyway, um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, anyway, that was when he was two. Um, and being an only child and not only interacting with your parents for months is tough. You know, I mean, he, he did COVID, uh, not COVID, he did uh, Zoom play dates, but it's not the same thing. And, and it was just tough. It was tough to manage his energy and it was tough to, to be on calls and he was trying to do school and he needed support and I would be on a call. Um, and so, you know, I think that just getting through that was, um, was challenging. It's better now. He's back in in-person school. Um, you know, as a company, we were able to pivot and keep our, our associates safe by bringing everybody home quickly. And then we slowly let people go back if they needed to be in the office for essential work. But, um, 
you know, so as a company, we really rallied behind that. And, and we're still remote, you know, um, unless you're a central worker. Uh, so that I think that was the, the most challenging thing is just the isolation uh, for, for my family, uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, for many companies, the, that COVID has served as a catalyst and really um, pushed forward the work from home agenda um, that was probably not for another 10 years off. Uh, do you see ADP uh, remaining more virtual? Oh, I think we're going to be virtual for a while. Uh, at some point, we're going to return to the office for sure. And we have a whole effort and we're looking at like the rates of infection in, in different places before we would allow our associates to be back in the office and obviously want to comply with local laws and everything. So um, we, we have the belief that we work better when we're around each other. Uh, we could be more collaborative when you're face to face. Mm -hmm. and so at some point we want to go back to the office, but um, we don't know when that is. And we just have to kind of be patient and wait for the right time. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, somebody commented uh, that your son is on a bike naturally. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't Do think about that. On that? <laughs> <laughs> that is great hilarious. observation. Great observation. Uh, well, we have a question from our own Susan Hitchcock, um, and she's asking, what early life experiences have most impacted who you are as a person and a leader? That's interesting. Let me think for a minute. Early life experiences. I'd say, um, you know, my father, when I was growing up, always said to me, you can do whatever you set your mind to. Like he just always would say that. It's like, you can do whatever you set your mind to. Um, and it just kind of, I guess it sunk in. Um, and, you know, he didn't, he also expected excellence. So uh, if we brought home an A minus, he wasn't happy. <laughs> so, 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 you know, um, he, he had, he expected us to, to do great things and to, you know, excel in whatever we were doing. And so um, I think those were some early life experiences that, that had shaped me is like the pursuit of excellence and, um, you know, and uh, yeah, just knowing that, that belief that you can do whatever you set your mind to. I keep telling my son that I say, if you can believe it, you can achieve it. He's like, well, I can't fly. <laughs> so, so he, so I was like, well, you can, if you, you know, design um, something and stuff, but anyway, so I, yeah, those were my it early with logic, son, don't confuse it with logic. <laughs> we had a saying that you had to work just as hard to get a C or a D than you do to get an A. So just go after the A. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question. How did you begin to tap into your why? That's a great question. Um, it really was reflecting. I just took time to reflect in terms of like what brought me joy. Uh, if we really sit and sit quietly with ourselves, you know kind of what brings you joy. And I, I think that is a signal in terms of what's your why. You know, if, if, it, if you're not joyful in, in your why, then it's not your why. Um, and then it's also kind of what, what your experiences are and how that shapes you in terms of how you can benefit, I think, is the for me. And so it, it just kind of landed for me as I reflected. It took a while, by the way. I kept just putting it out there like, what is my why? And I just looked at like my life and I just looked at kind of how things have evolved in my life. And and it just resonated with me to to be able to articulate it. And, and now that I've articulated it, it's great because I can evaluate different things to figure out is that in alignment or is it not right mm -hmm. and so you could you could it, it gives you the ability to say no to things too like when susan called me about this i was like absolutely <laughs> you know because it's so in line with my why yeah. right uh, i didn't hesitate um so hopefully that's helpful yeah yeah we always think about if, if you're not living in alignment with your why then life gets clunky it gets very messy so um, so you're a great uh, role model for that, too. Uh, someone has said, I like your stance on finding an organization that embraces your authenticity in the workplace. Asking for a friend, what if someone's current organization has not progressed with DE&I? 
how would one navigate their career at such an organization or do they just leave? Yeah, so I would say it depends. It's like the lawyer answer. So I would say um, if the organization has the bones to, to get there, right? So you, you see structurally that they're setting things up mm -hmm. to, to enable that success. You have to be patient with organizations because things don't change overnight. I mean, it does, they don't change overnight. I, I, like I was sharing, I, I watched the uh, Good Trouble uh, movie this, this over the weekend, mm -hmm. and it took a lot of years to accomplish what we accomplished from a civil rights perspective. It didn't happen overnight. The sit-ins over sit-ins and the, you know, the nonviolent protests and, and getting allies in. Um, and so I think we're on a journey as a country and, and, you know, institutions and particularly organizations and corporations. And so it, I, you have to kind of reflect and say, are they doing enough in the right way? This is my opinion, and in, in to, to get it right. And am I willing to kind of support and, and wait that out? And, and is that like, is that fulfilling? Like, can I, can I like thrive in that environment? Um, and if they're not, if they don't, if they're not making the efforts and it's, it's draining and you're dying in that environment, then it's probably time to go, right? Because there are a lot of organizations that are making the efforts. And so I, I go back to life's too short to, to spend too much time in an organization that's just not right. Right, right. All right, so great advice, great advice. Uh, unless there's any other questions, ah, here, here's one. Um, and this will be our last question. So uh, we'll um, want to encourage everyone to stay on because uh, uh, once we um, talk about what's coming up at TurkNet here in a few minutes, then we want to come back uh, to Jerry for one last comment and you'll want to stay tuned for that. So what are some of the best LGBTQ organizations to support in the Atlanta area as a company or an individual? Um, so in the Atlanta area, I don't know if Georgia Equality is still around. Uh, there's the Atlanta Pride. Uh, there's a lot of organizations, and I'm sorry if I, there's a way I can get a message back later, but there's a there's a youth organization. I can't remember the name of it, but it's really focused on LGBTQ homeless youth, right? It's, because, and it's lost youth. and found youth. Thank you. Um, that is a great organization because uh, what often happens with um, LGBTQ not often, but sometimes um, there's a disenfranchisement. And so uh, this organization is really providing the resources uh, to, to allow you know, them to, um, you know, to thrive. And so I would, I would uh, look that organization up. Um, so those are a couple, you know, they, there's the annual AIDS, AIDS walk that happens in the Atlanta area as well. Mm -hmm. I will tell you what, when my wife and I moved down here, one thing we, we were disheartened about is there was no center. We, we drove around looking for a center. There's a center in, in New York City. It's kind of the gathering place where they have all sorts of community events and things, but there, there isn't one, unfortunately. I think there used to be one, but they closed down. Um, Barb, do, do you have any, do you, do, do you know of any others? Yeah, you know, Lost and Found Youth is one of my favorites. Um, there's also a, an organization called PALS, which is Pets Are Loving uh, Support. And it takes in pets for uh, folks in the, in the gay community, many of whom had AIDS, HIV, when, back when it was a death sentence. That organization was started to make sure that people could keep their pets till the very end and that they had food and vet care and things like that. PALS still exists. Um, and so, but now it's branched out. It's for all, all people who, uh, who are facing critical life ending illnesses and making sure that they don't have to give up their pets along the way. That's another one that's, that's really good. But I agree with you, Jerry, it would be so wonderful to have a community center and, and they're really vibrant, active places. Um, there's one in Denver, there's one in Austin, New York City. It's, Maybe that's a things to do for you in the next. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and I would write that down. I, maybe that is it. And I think uh... you may have found a partner to uh, <laughs> to assist you, right, Barbara? 
<laughs> I love that. I, yeah, my wife would love that. She would love that too. She's very social, <laughs> social person. So, wow. Well, this has been fantastic. Uh, so I just want to bring to everybody's attention some of the things that are going on at TurkNet. Uh, and then uh, we'll turn it back over. So hang on, because there's one last piece of wisdom that we're going to be asking Jerry. Uh, so the, uh, the one thing that I want to bring to your attention is March is uh, Women's History Month. And International Women's Day is on Monday, March the 8th. Uh, so to celebrate Women's Chamber of Commerce in partnership with the City of Atlanta, Technology Association of Georgia, consulate generals of five different countries are hosting a day-long program aimed at advancing gender equality and the power of women. So there uh, will be a link in the chat. So check there for that and how you may register for this day-long program. Sounds wonderful. Um, we at TurkNet have uh, launched an inclusion, diversity, equity, and action coaching certification program. We are just finishing up our first cohort, and we're going to start our second cohort this summer. Um, it's really a great program for internal coaches, trainers, anyone in HR or leaders that are interested in building a culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if you're interested in our second cohort, be sure to contact Tino Mantella, who is our CEO and president, and his contact information is there on the screen. And um, I'm excited to announce that our next Women in Leadership series will feature uh, Karen Robinson Cope, who is the executive chairman of Ongev, um, she's an accomplished entrepreneur and CEO of four high growth technical and media companies. Um, and I'm going to be joined by TurkNet's founder, Lynn TurkNet, who's going to co-host and lead what really should be a fascinating conversation with a woman that's clearly building and leading large, very successful organizations. So please join us Friday, March 26th at 8 a.m. for our next Women in Leadership program. And uh, TurkNet is about to launch our all new website. So stay tuned for that. Um, it's gonna make it much easier to access a, a lot of rich content. You can also find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. So please uh, connect with us there. And uh, then of course, there's the old fashioned way too. So here's our contact information. All right, Barbara. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you and uh, and for you to close it out with our wonderful guest, Jerry. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who's joined today. I know it's challenging at the end of a busy week. This, this protected time on a Friday morning is hard to uh, hold on to sometimes. So thank you for all of you who've been here with us this morning for this rich, rich conversation. Um, right behind my computer, I have a sign that says, kind people are my kind of people. And uh, I just feel like I, I, it just speaks to me today to say that uh, I appreciate the kindness and the wisdom that Jerry has brought to this session. And um, want to just thank you so much for taking the time to reflect, taking the time to prepare, taking the time to show up uh, as, a strong, as a strong leader and impart some of your wisdom. So thank you so much for that. And then we have one, one last question. So this is, we call this our one thing. Uh, and the question is, what is the one thing you would leave for all of us listening? Thank you. Well, I, can I just say that I've really enjoyed this conversation, Barb, and thank you to TurkNet Leadership Group for inviting me uh, to be part of this wonderful uh, series. And you now have a another uh, follower, and I'm going to really follow the, the work that you've been doing at TurkNet because it's uh, it's terrific, and it's great to have this type of an environment and setting to to for people to grow and learn. And I would say that the one uh, piece of wisdom is that I encourage everybody to remember that no matter where you are in life or what role you have in your organization, you are there for a reason. Uh, you were meant to make a positive impact and uh, challenge yourself in terms of what you think is possible. Because I, I can assure you that what is possible is 
far greater than what you can even imagine. And um, I will leave with a quote. I love quotes. Uh, so there's a, a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt that says, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. That's a great one. That is a great one. Thank you so much. I will remind everyone that you have homework. Your homework is to pick your thing. Your homework is to share it with five and then convince those five to keep sharing. And I would love to for Jerry to get some emails back of how you've shared, what you shared and what was impactful to you. So thank you again. We appreciate your time and your commitment to this and giving back in a meaningful way to our Women in Leadership series. And um, have a great day and a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Take care.